generous. Hello. Let's uh, everybody sit down, grab your seat. Let's get started. A long, exciting day. We want to get started right away, so everyone take your seats. It's so wonderful to see so many people here. We have almost filled the room, but we have others that are coming in and trickling in as the day goes on. So this is a very exciting time. My name is Jenny Nolan. I'm the director of the Network on Child Protection and Wellbeing. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But let's get started by just seeing who's in the room. I know that we have a group of some of the most distinguished researchers in the world, uh, but we'll talk later with them. But where are our practitioners, our social workers, our front lines people, our staff from, yes, good, fantastic. Great, great. Students, students, we got students. I know a lot of you are signed up, undergraduates, graduates, postdocs, great. Well, there's a reason that we brought you all together like this from all these different angles. Um, and I want to do acknowledgments. Is it hard to hear? Someone's saying hard to hear? I want to do acknowledgments later. But I want to start um, by reminding us of a story, an important story. So Alyosha is the youngest and purest of Dostoevsky's brothers Karamazov. He's concerned that his brother Ivan has publicly professed himself an atheist. And being a monk, his brother's salvation is vitally important to him, so he implores Ivan to tell him why he has abandoned his faith. Ivan tells his brother that he simply cannot espouse belief in a benevolent creator who would knowingly allow children to suffer abuse. To make his case, Ivan goes on to describe accounts of child abuse that he has witnessed throughout his travels. And Dostoevsky doesn't stop at just two or three examples. He devotes pages and pages and pages to five, six, seven, eight accounts of chilling stories of children being victimized with gruesome detail and unspeakable acts. And as you read it, you can't help wondering, why so many accounts? Why does he go on and on? We get the point. We got it after number five. But Dostoevsky is relentless, perhaps because he wanted to begin a conversation about child abuse in a way that was difficult to ignore or brush aside. And although this was published in 1880, the details of these accounts resonate even today. Yes, these stories are still all too familiar to those of you who work on the front lines, those of you who do treatment, and those of you who are trying to make sense of these stories. Now rest assured that we get another 600 pages, right, to figure out if Yvonne can reconcile his faith crisis. And Dostoevsky does this by presenting redemptive examples of human decency and intervening on behalf of suffering children. He does this perhaps because he recognized that the simple telling of the story is not enough. It's what we do with the story that counts. The same is true for knowledge. Knowledge does no good if it sits untranslated in academic journals or gets buried behind the jargon of university walls. And knowledge does no good if it addresses unimportant questions or has little or no impact on a problem. Answering relevant questions that generate workable solutions is the chief responsibility of science. And then translating these solutions into products that can be realistically implemented in the end user environment. Yes, these are the stepping stones of science, of scientific impact, taking ideas through the scientific method, then through implementation, refinement, and uptake. We all know these steps. But we all know that this process can take years, even decades, before knowledge becomes useful. And in the meantime, more and more of Dostoevsky's stories get told. This is why we are here today. This is why we brought basic scientists together who work at the molecular level, together with scientists who understand the human processes of resilience and the possibilities for reversing the damage of stress, trauma, and maltreatment. This is why we so value the presence of child welfare professionals and advocates, to ensure that we are asking the right questions and working toward workable, useful solutions. 
If we look at the problem through many different lenses, the science to practice process can be accelerated. All right, so those of you who know me, you know I can be a little impatient. I've been told I'm a little impatient. For example, I like to think that if we collectively work together, these are not merely stepping stones, but rather leaping stones. How coming together to have a conversation and produce a common language, we can help each other in accelerating the process of science. All right, so you all know this game of leapfrog, right? We used to play it as kids before there was electronics, right? This is where one person bends down, another person jumps over, and then you take turns jumping over and jumping over. And together you make, you make better progress and more swiftly than you would alone. Okay? I'd like us to think about the game of leapfrog for the next few days. I'd like us to think about our contribution to solutions. I'd like us to think about ways we can facilitate change. When is it our turn to leap? And when is it that we should be on the ground helping someone else's progress? Whether it's crafting a special issue of a journal or contributing to a repository or helping to recruit families for research. Now there are several varieties of frogs on your tables, right? Okay, right. The frog thing, where does the frog come from? All right. Um, these are leaping frogs. I want you to play with these throughout the next few days. Make them leap. Okay, take them home, put them in your offices to remind you that collectively we can make swift progress. All right, and they, we all play important roles in the, the complexity of these problems. And on behalf of vulnerable and suffering children to remind you to keep the conversation going. Now, okay, not all games of leapfrog end without setback. So this is me, right, and my sister. Uh, I got a big old black eye, five stitches. All right, I was doing what? Yes, playing leapfrog, right? I didn't trust my friend's process. I got impatient. I was like, where is she? I looked back and she was coming over at the same time, bam, in the hospital, right? So this is all just to say that although we may desire to help one another in greasing the skids of science to practice, we have to remember that we're all coming from different perspectives. We all have different masters. We all satisfy different stakeholders. So we need to be patient. We need to communicate effectively. And this is the way we'll maximize our collective success, OK? And there are few resources to bring together people like this. There are few resources. But there are some. For example, this conference is part of an annual conference series brought to you by Penn State's Network on Child Protection and Well-Being, which I am privileged to direct. This network was established in 2012 as Penn State's academic response to addressing the complex problems of child maltreatment. This is an unprecedented commitment from the university to enact a 12 faculty cluster hire of researchers from multiple disciplines who will address the problem of child maltreatment from many different lenses. Now, since then, we have hired nine of these 12 faculty across five colleges and at University Park in the College of Liberal Arts, Health and Human Development, College of Education, College of Nursing, and then at Penn State Hershey through the Division of Child Abuse Pediatrics, and then our clinic where we deliver mental health uh, services to victims. So we have faculty hired across all of these disciplines. Now, I, I don't have time to introduce everyone right now, but I've made all the faculty wear these black ribbons, right? They can't hide. So seek them out and help them understand your place in the conversation and let them tell you about their place in the conversation. And together, we are working on four key areas of impact. Yes, basic science, much like we're talking about today, but a lot of areas of basic science prevention and treatment, not just new ways of looking at prevention, uh, but how do we optimize treatment and how do we implement treatment in every community. And then engagement in education, um, much like this event and all the training activities that we have going on from the undergraduate level on up, we'll say more about that later. And then translation, much like this conference, but in many ways, raising awareness. So it is great to have President Barron here today so that he can see the fruits of these efforts. 
President Barron came to Penn State in May of 2014 from Florida State University, where he served four years as president. But before that, he spent 20 years here at Penn State. He was serving as dean of the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences, where he initiated, initiated a whole substantive focus on the total study of Earth as a system. All right, so this guy thinks big, all right? He was recently, um, by Industry Magazine, ranked among the 50 R&D stars to watch. And President Barron, we are watching. And we thank you for your commitment to this issue and for being here today. So, President Barron. Well, good morning, and on behalf, of, on behalf of Penn State, I'd like to thank you for attending this conference that is so important to our children's health and well-being. To begin, I wish to recognize the conference organizers, Jeannie Noel and Sandy Kyler, who are the director and assistant director of the Network on Child Protection and Well-Being. We're proud that this is a substantive conference that addresses the issues with a variety of perspectives and voices, and that was a great introduction, and I think we should thank both of you for organizing this, this meeting. Thank you. And now perhaps Susan McHale, Director of Children, Youth, and Family Consortium and Professor at Penn State. Would you just stand for a minute? I'm sure everybody knows you, or you waved over there. <clears throat> Susan, Penn State Hershey CEO Craig Hillmeyer, and former Penn State President Rod Erickson were primarily responsible for leading the charge at Penn State to develop an academic mission around combating child maltreatment. Craig and Susan co-chaired a task force that developed the proposal for the Network for Child Protection and Well-Being, which, with President Erickson's approval, became the centerpiece of our efforts to protect children and families. So I just want to thank you for all of your efforts as, as well. Statistics show that there are about 2 million new cases of abuse or neglect each year in the United States, and that roughly 13% of youth in this nation will be involved with Child Protective Services at least once by the time they reach 18. Furthermore, child abuse and intentional injury claim the lives of about 2,500 children a year. This is a higher rate than all of the pediatric cancers combined. Childhood maltreatment has tragic mental and physical health consequences for the developing child, and the repercussions can last a lifetime, as I'm sure that this group knows. Over the last two decades, research has shown that child abuse victims are significantly greater risk for obesity and mental health disorders, substance abuse, sexually transmitted diseases, teen pregnancy, brain maldevelopment, and lower IQ. As adults, they have higher rates of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, endocrine disorders, accelerated aging, dementia, and even premature death. Beyond the human toll, consider that the public health bill associated with maltreatment tops $130 billion annually. This number exceeds the cost of lead exposure, autism, childhood obesity, cancer, and asthma combined. Your work to combat the stress and trauma of maltreatment is critical to help change those statistics. As the abolitionist and statesman Frederick Douglass said, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Or you may prefer the words of another very wise man, Dr. Seuss, a person's a person no matter how small, just to be a little lighter. Many of you work directly with survivors and are champions and advocates for children. And I hope you will fully engage with the researchers and scientists at this conference. The science focused on child maltreatment will be fortified with the idea, 
ideas of those who, su who serve children on the front lines. I'm proud to say that Penn State has also stepped up to this challenge with significant resources, and I'd just like to share a few examples. First and foremost, Penn State's network on child protection and well-being is focused on advancing the science involved in presenting, detecting, and in preventing, detecting, and treating child maltreatment and in promoting healthy development for survivors. Penn State has also conducted an interdisciplinary faculty cluster hire, as you heard, which crosses five colleges and developed an associated research and clinical infrastructure. This is an unprecedented opportunity to take basic research to translational science. In addition, the network is helping policymakers recognize that the prevention and treatment of child abuse and trauma is worthy of significant public health investment. The network is also devoted to, edu to its education and outreach mission. This conference is part of an annual series to promote awareness and to showcase cutting edge scientific advancement. Finally, last month, Penn State Board of Trustees approved an intercollege minor in child maltreatment and advocacy studies. This is a one-of-a-kind minor and is designed to inspire young people to choose professions that serve at-risk children and their families on many fronts, from law enforcement to pediatric medicine subspecialties to nursing research. These are just some of the activities that network faculty have undertaken in the past three years since its launch. Just in closing, I would like to thank you for your commitment to child protection and for promoting the next steps in the scientific enterprise around child maltreatment. I look forward to seeing how your work can benefit the lives of children, their families, and communities. And I just want to personally thank you for being here to work on such an important uh, topic, and I wish you great success in your conference. Thank you. Okay, thank you, President Barron. All right, so with that, we can get started on our exciting day. So we are tweeting. I don't really know what that is, but we are doing it. Um, what, Sandy, what is it again? It, do we have the tweet thing up here? It's, do I go, have to go back up? Okay, anyway, there's a tweet, there's a tweet. And we're blogging. Is Taylor here, the blogger? Where is Taylor? There she is. She's from the College of Communications, right? We're working on something called um, scientific journalism, right? And we're working on how to translate science into lay language and inspire the public about science. So Taylor's been working on a blog that she'll keep, um, keep going. And then our tweet, right? You're going to tweet for every session. Um, we have, uh, if you parked here, you've got a little white ticket. You can get it validated at the front desk. All right, don't forget about that. CEs uh, outside sign up. Um, CEUs for social work and psychology, right, Sandy? Yes, okay. Um, and I think that's about all the housekeeping we have. Anything else? Okay, so we're going to start with Don Chalev, right? We're going to introduce. Yeah, we'll start with our first session. And Don gets to um, introduce our first group of session speakers. So. <laughs> Idan is one of our uh, network faculty. Do we need to slow down a second? And um, first is
Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Thank you for joining us. So my name is Idan Shalev and I'm delighted uh, to open the first session of the conference. Um, as Jenny mentioned, um, faculty in the Department of Biobarrival Health and also a member of the new network of child protection and well-being. I'm not going to repeat everything that Jenny said about the network. Uh, just to emphasize that uh, in this annual meeting, we're going to showcase uh, our focus on diverse biological processes, from immunology to brain development to genomics, and finally, the opportunity for our reversibility in translational efforts. Uh, because uh, for those of you who are non-biologists, you can say that this is all really interesting, but at the end, who cares, right? What do we do with this information? Uh, so I think even before the last session, you will see that we should all care about uh, this research. Uh, okay, so the opening session uh, is on endocrinology and uh, immunology. And the first talk is actually by uh, a colleague and a friend, Dr. Andrea Denizi. Um, Andrea is coming to us from the UK, where he's uh, a senior lecturer at the prestigious Institute of Psychiatry at King's College London. He's particularly interested in the effects of child stress on immune and metabolic functioning, uh, which can lead to a better understanding of how, how child stress affects mental and physical health. And he already published a couple of seminal studies uh, on this topic. He's also a real doctor, has uh, both MD and PhD degrees, so he really knows what he's talking about when it comes to clinical outcomes. Uh, and I guess that a few years ago, if I had to present Andrea, I would have said that uh, he's the rising star. But I think that now we can drop the rising because his star already shines out there. And I'm really happy that you can join us. Thank you. Andrea? So good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me? Yeah, perfect. Um, so let me start by thanking the organizer uh, for inviting me um, here and also for putting together uh, what um, is surely going to be a couple of extremely interesting and I'm sure impactful days uh, thinking about science as it relates to uh, childhood trauma and maltreatment, but also how science can be translated um, for benefits in the clinic. Um, as uh, Idan um, was saying, I come from the UK. I work at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience, part of King's College London. And uh, I lead a team of uh, um, doctors uh, and psychologists um, um, who specialize in the assessment and treatment of children who have um, experienced uh, different types of trauma and who have uh, anxiety disorders. And what I would like to talk to you um, today about is uh, um, some of the effects of these um, traumas and maltreatment and early life stress on the immune system and how um, exploring the effects of um, stress on the immune system might uncover some new pathways in which we can understand why maltreatment is such an important risk factor for psychopathology. So just briefly, I will give you an introduction, a background on the relationship between early life stress and uh, uh, immunology. Um, make a brief summary of biological studies. Think about how these biological studies might have clinical implications that we um, could benefit from, and then draw some conclusions. So to begin with, um, today I will focus particularly um, on the relationship between childhood maltreatment and depression. Um, and uh, although there is plenty of evidence that maltreatment is one of the key risk factors for um, the development of depression later in life, what is much less clear is how maltreatment might contribute to the risk for depression later in life. And what I will try to argue is that uh, the immune system, and particularly immunology, uh, particularly inflammation, um, is one of the key mediating factors that might explain these effects. So to begin with, what do I mean by inflammation? Inflammation